I'm giving a talk on Kafka. Um, I guess the question that we should always ask is why? Um, so this is a tool that we could use to help with our inter-app communication. Um, basically making sense of all the mess that is our apps and the way they talk to each other. Um, the other thing we can use it for is what's called data integration. Um, that's taking all the data from our various sources, uh, whether that's you know our MySQL database, Redash, uh, querying, um, Redis, Elasticsearch, like all that stuff is sort of sent back and forth in a uh, not systematic way. Uh, so what we're going to talk about to start is the idea of the log. Um, so the specific implementation implementation of that would be Kafka um, and then we'll also talk about stream processing which is using the data in the log um, and the tool that I looked at for that is called SAMHSA um, there are others but that's the one I know um, and then we're going to look at how we could apply this to our organization and our data specifically uh, so the log is um, specifically called the log. Um, and there's a reason for this. It's not stuff like this Kibana setup. Um, so this is the slide from Joe's presentation. Um, these are what I would call application logs. So it's the stuff that Nginx spits out, Unicorn, uh, things you try to look at when stuff is going wrong, um, or if Talent Finder people are getting banned. Um, that's not what we're talking about. Um, so this is the log as an abstraction. Uh, it's a fairly simple data source. It looks kind of like a list. You have stuff that's in order, and anything you add to it goes at the end. It's really very simple. Uh, and do you have any questions? That's it. Uh, no. So the, the log is used in quite a few places. Uh, for example, this is a diagram from Percona's training. Uh, if you notice, there are bin logs and relay logs. That's how the master communicates with the slave. Um, there's also in the Redis thing about persistence, there's a mention of the append only file, which sounds a lot like a log, that logs every write operation. And you can use that to reconstruct the original data set. We'll come back to that idea in a little bit. Um, so another example, sort of example, is like our git commit history. Uh, that's like a string or a series of changes that you can follow in order and if you follow them all the way through, you can generate our code base at any point in time. So how you use it would be a data source, say our Doximity app, the database, anything, write stuff to the end of the log. And then a destination system over here would keep track of where it is in the log. So for this example, there's a system that is looking at section 7. And if that system is reading section 7, you can know for sure that it's processed 0 through 6. And you can know that with confidence because the log is always in order, immutable. It's not going to change. Everything only goes on to the end. You can't update stuff in the middle. Um, so that's really valuable. Um, another slight complication in the way that Kafka scales out is there's an idea of partitions. Um, so instead of a single huge log that one server is in control of and you have to like do all the coordination between servers on who can write when and have a whole problem there, um, you do partitioning. So a simple scheme would be something like partition by ID and since there's three partitions here, say ID modulus three, um, so zero would go to partition zero, one to one, two to two, and then three would wrap back around to partition zero. Uh, so why is that important? Uh, what it means is if you have something like ID zero and then you wanna change the value, say change new, uh, the name to something else, if you add that to the log at the bottom, because you partition by ID, it's going to go to partition zero. So if you look at partition zero, you see every single 
thing related to ID zero. And you know it's guaranteed in order even though say like partition one, event one might have happened way before partition zero, event zero. You know that within the individual partition stuff is in order. Um, so let's talk about what Question. Yeah. So uh, it's not clear. So the, the the order is guaranteed across all partitions, or like in the in the individual partition. Individual partition. Yeah. So all say all changes to ID three would always go in partition zero. So you would know those are in order, but not maybe ID one versus ID three. Yeah. So there are clients keeping track of their own offsets. Uh, the the writers don't, the readers do, yeah. How is that typically persisted, right? Like, if your app goes down, you want to... Uh, so actually, what, what people will do is they'll write the current offset that they're at into Kafka. So that's like using the log to consume the log. Um, and it's always in order and guaranteed append to the end. So yeah, it works out pretty well. Um, so stream processing. This, pretty simply, is the idea of logs plus jobs. Um, you are taking data in the log and doing operations on it. Um, so there's kind of simple three things you could do. Uh, you could either write something to the log, you can read something from the log, or you can read and then write something. Um, and that's what a lot of stream processing is. Uh, so as a diagram, you would say take log A, log B, and do some processing on the two of those. Uh, say like log A was uh, doc news reads and log B was ad clicks or something like that. You could then join the two to figure out conversion rate. Um, so now that we have these two tools, we have this Kafka hammer in our hand. Uh, let's do the thing that engineers do and go look for nails. Uh, so, it's a little hard to see, but this is our diagram that Jay made of our inter-app communication. Uh, this was, what, a few months ago? Um, so it's gotten even more complicated since then. Um, this is the flow of data and requests through our app. Um, it's kind of crazy. Uh, so I don't have an example of this simplified yet, so let's use LinkedIn's. Um, this was their equivalent diagram. Um, so if you can imagine, they have different data sources, uh, like Espresso, Voldemort, Oracle are all data sources. Um, they have services that use them, user tracking, operational logs, and then all that stuff goes in different places. So you can see how this would quickly become like a big O of n squared problem, where everything needs to talk to everything, so anytime you add a new service, you add a connection between that and every single other service. Uh, so that's kind of what we have going on here. Um, but this is what the ideal uh, thing we're gonna move towards, hopefully, where everything can write into this unified log and everything's in order, everything is, has a schema attached, um, and then you can pull from it. Uh, the idea would be that, say, user tracking could write data to the log, but it doesn't necessarily have to know that Hadoop, log search, monitoring, and the data warehouse all have to have that data in a certain particular format. Um, uh, so this is uh, not really great for like the request response thing. Uh, you wouldn't really like tell, like, put something into the log saying you want data, and then read the log to get data back. Uh, this is really good for asynchronous communication. So you can kind of think about it as like a cross-application rescue queue. Um, so you could use it, say, um, well really to, okay, decouple producers and consumers. Um, you can say you want something done and push that to a log, and then other apps and other teams can pull that data off and do something with it. Um, it also has the advantage of strong ordering and persistence guarantees. So stuff you put in there will be uh, guaranteed to be correct, basically. Um, so it's not like the log where we have like Elk and Kibana stack um, losing log information. It's not like stuff where it's simple 
you kind of use it to know information if it's slightly off by a few percent um, it's not a problem um, it's actually like got really strong performance and consistency and ordering guarantees um, and on the I guess on the term of performance uh, one of the reasons why this is great is because the log is sequential super ordered um, everything's written in sequential order, everything is read in sequential order. Stuff that's really good at reading and writing data in sequential order would be, you know, hard drives and memory. It's like the perfect use case. Uh, so stuff is really fast. Um, typical, like, three to ten server implementations can do hundreds of thousands to millions of requests per second. So it's, uh, yeah, you can pump a lot of data through there. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the examples that we could do. These are just things I thought about. So if I don't completely understand a part of the app, uh, you'll just have to work with me. Um, but one of the things we have trouble with is email queuing. Um, whether it's performance or uh, knowing if emails actually get sent or getting the uh, data back about emails you send. Um, one thing you could do is, say, write uh, data to Kafka from like say Doximity, Amion, or even Maverick itself could write to a Kafka log. Then you would have an email processor that sits in the middle and that would communicate with SendGrid and then afterwards it could write data back to the Kafka log which um, either uh, like you could pump that to the database or read it directly. Um, so another thing I was thinking about is say the uh, event tracking in Doc News and Campaigns. Uh, that's a lot of data, and that's like a, a high performance part of our app. Um, on Saturdays, we have like our graphs going through the roof and then back down. Um, so one thing we could do to improve performance is <clears throat> stick all that data into Kafka, and then on the back end, uh, do the event processing, um, and then store it into the database. Um, so. Another cool thing about Kafka is the ecosystem. Um, so people build tools on top of it. <coughs> One of those is Maxwell. Um, it's basically a nice combination of MySQL and Kafka. So if you remember, we have these logs in MySQL. Um, that's the way that the um, master talks to the slave. Um, so what you can do is sit in between that connection there and basically set yourself up as a um, as a replica slave. <clears throat> and through that, you can get Kafka topic data that includes everything that goes into the MySQL database. So anytime you make a change, whether it's a SQL update on the entire users table or just a simple insert, that would emit a Kafka event, which you could listen for in another um, process. So say on the insert, you see there's the database, the table, type. Um, can I get some water? <coughs> Ugh. And then you also see the old data on updates. So what you can do with this is, say, uh, replace all the callback hell that is active record and all our tools. Oh, I'll get it from downstairs. Okay. Do you know if, uh, if you're doing like an update, like potentially multiple records or something, like, do you get access to all the data that changed or something? Yeah. Yeah, that would be really cool if I can get all of you in Yep. So that's actually like a part of the replication um, system. <clears throat> it depends on how you have replication set up. Uh, sometimes you can send it with just the command, which will be kind of hard to manage. Um, but MySQL will actually send like the full row replication if you have it set up for that. <clears throat> So I did some, some number crunching. Um, our database does 700 rows inserted uh, and about 100 each rows deleted and updated per second um, over about a month. So that's only about, about 1,000 operations per second. 
Um, so let's say it's a kilobyte per operation to store it. And we replicate it three times, that would only be one and a half terabytes to store every single change in our database for a week on a weekly rolling basis. Um, which is not bad, it'd be like, you know, disk is cheap. Uh, so how could we use this? Um, I remember something that Ashwin did <clears throat> for search people you may know, where basically when you add a colleague, it would look up another people you may know and stick it in the search. So like, would you like to search for this person? Um, the way he was doing that was every minute running a Python job that would look for any new colleagues and then insert that data back into the database. Um, so instead of that, we could do real-time processing where on a colleague added database event, we would run a Python change processor that would then insert data back into the database in the appropriate places. Um, but this actually kind of got me thinking, um, what is a database? So it also made me think, what are tables? Um, ugh. The way I usually explain it to like my wife is it's like a big spreadsheet and the spreadsheets are connected and stuff like that. But it's actually <laughs> it's actually a um, it's a thing that you build by making changes to data. So what what is a database besides a bunch of insert and update and delete commands? Um, if you remember from that Redis slide. Uh, the Redis database is able to reconstruct its entire data set based on its replication log, or its um, append-only file. So if you think about it, when you like take a MySQL dump, it's just a bunch of insert commands, and then things that change that are a bunch of insert commands. So reconstructing a database is something you could do if you had, say, an infinitely long amount of database changes, so the entire stream through history. Um, it might take a lot of data to do that, um, but you could. And a, so a table is just a point in time instance of that uh, list of changes. Um, it's also, if you know what a materialized view is, that's kind of the idea. Um, it's a uh, representation of data that's in another table um, that you can change. Um, so let's say we have one of these streams of changes. Say the user change log from the beginning of time and the account change log from the beginning of time. You could say merge those together into a user or account change log. <coughs> so with that data, you would have a new stream that was anytime a user changed or an account changed. And it would be sort of like a SQL command select star from users join uh, accounts where account ID matches. Um, so something I built to sort of test this idea out is something to index our specialties and subspecialties. Uh, basically the way it works is it takes that Maxwell um, stream, splits it out into specialties and subspecialties, any changes to those two tables. And then we can actually repartition that. So instead of uh, partitioning by ID for subspecialties, you partition by specialty code. And what that means is you can join, you would send anything with the same specialty code to the same partition on a server. And then this SAMSA processor could combine those together to produce um, specialties join subspecialties. And then you could do some manipulation on that data to produce the exact thing that we need to show up into Elasticsearch. <coughs> Which would mean that instead of the data update tool, you could just do like SQL commands and stuff would automatically propagate through the system. So say we update um, specialties, what would happen is it would propagate from Maxwell up to specialties and then automatically get joined with the existing data in the lower stream and then produce the result at the end. Um, so, if you guys want to see that. So, the first thing to do is start the grid. Um, so, this starts Zookeeper, uh, Yarn, and Kafka. 
Uh, once that's done, we can start in Maxwell. Uh, this is the piece of software that follows the replication logs and pushes the data into Kafka. Um, so from there, we're going to start the SAMHSA jobs. The first one splits up the Maxwell stream into one stream per table. Uh, this lets us do per table operations like repartitioning and joining. Uh, the next task is going to take the specialties table, which doesn't have a primary key, and repartition it by code. The next one is going to do the same thing for subspecialties. Then we're going to take the repartitioned subspecialties um, queue or topic and partition that by specialty code. That will let us join it against uh, specialties by code. Um, so the task here is going to join those two together. And then finally, we're going to take that data and um, move it around and change the format to match what Elasticsearch is going to expect. Um, so if we watch the Maxwell stream, then switch to our database, then you'll notice if I make any changes, say to the users table, um, I'll find my username and say I remove the ink. That'll automatically send an update here. Um, so let's say we watch the um, specialty stream, then that same change or switching the change back will not send any messages here. Um, so if we look at it partition by, or right, now let's go back to specialties. So if I change the text here, you'll see that a message gets passed, but because this table doesn't have a primary key, um, it doesn't send any key right here. So in the specialties by, or the, let's see, change that, all right, specialties by code will show the change here with the proper code. Um, then if we go to the joined stream, we can make any changes here uh, to kick it off. I'm going to update uh, specialties. And subspecialties. I bet there is a debugger running. All right, so here are the changes come through. Now let's uh, clear the screen, and if we look at a particular specialty, let's say I change this back, um, we'll see if we look at this data that um, here the name has been updated in the data field. And then let's pull this out and take a look at it in a better formatted form. So here we have the new name is passed in the data field along with all the existing data. Um, under subspecialties, the automatically joined subspecialty data is there and in a similar format. Um, and then if we go to the very last couple lines, we'll see that the old field has the old value, which was acute care nurse practitioner one, two, three. So let's take a look also at, say, the subspecialties. If I update one and say, change head and neck, uh, let me clear this, change head and neck to head and neck, one, two, three. So this is a subspecialty. We'll see that the general plastic surgery specialty is getting updated. Um, that's PS00, and that's based on this uh, foreign key here. But if you look in this list, we can see that the specialty will have the updated subspecialty field. And that is going to be um, somewhere in here. 
So PS06 has the updated name. Now this is the Maxwell format and this is including stuff like the commit status and um, the field as a data field. So Elasticsearch doesn't understand this format exactly. So if we look at the stream that is Elasticsearch specialties, and this is created by that Elasticsearch indexing specialties indexer task. Um, we'll see here that there's another set of values and this is based on what our index is. It's uh, manually created right now. But if I clear this and we go back and update this back to normal, you'll see that this like root value, other code, name, and then subspecialties in the format that Elasticsearch expects are automatically updated. And so you'll see it's pretty quick um, processing through several SAMHSA tasks, but happening almost instantly. And even something like running this again will automatically update everything. So the question is, why do we split the stream and then join them back together? Um, and what does the stream look like after that? We need to do that to the beginning one. Um, <coughs> and the real reason is that the Maxwell stream uh, contains every change to every table in the entire database. Um, and all we really want is the specialties changes and the subspecialties changes. And then we want um, not a row per change, but we want a new row that has both the specialty information and the subspecialties that are attached to that. Okay, and then when you're merging, like, is there like another data store for that process that is basically... Yeah, so, so the, the SAMHSA task actually has a local uh, RocksDB database, um, and that is like a key value store that you use. Uh, yeah. Okay. <coughs> and now, I think I asked you that already with uh, the numbers. SAMHSA is, is basically taking care of like creating the pipeline, right? Yeah. Yeah. Does it do its own scheduling jobs or do something else? Like uh, so it runs on top of Yarn, which is like the Hadoop process manager. Gotcha. Okay. So with the example like this, you're taking, you know, you have access to historical changes to the schema too, right? Because it's every run, yeah. every read yeah. you have. Um, so does that basically come for like your final state uh, once you've merged uh, the specialties and subspecialties back in the joint is going to be the final state that you're writing at? Uh, yeah, so um, let me see if I have an example. But I, like, I don't think it would be replacing, or basically everything would be tracked like that, like the database yeah. data overall. Yeah. But in the case of like a writing a right to Elasticsearch, you have to have knowledge of like what the current mapping is, right? Yeah, so that was that was one of the questions I had yesterday for Ben, um, which is if this pipeline is taking care of writing to Elasticsearch, the, the current mappings which you put in the models today would have to be stored somewhere else, right? So that this this tool has access to them. Yeah. Um, so it wouldn't be managed by the Rails application anymore, which does have some nice side effects as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my, my idea for that is that this <coughs> um, processor, the second one to the right um, over here, would be the thing that would take this data from both specialties and subspecialties and sort of manipulate it around into exactly what we want to go into Elasticsearch. And then, I guess, so the, the original right um, is coming from something that is blind to whether it has enough data to write all the, the math fields, right? Um, for, sorry. So like, um, the original write is coming from some application or some insertion into the database, right? Yeah, yeah, just any any normal SQL command will trigger the replication log. So as, as long as the <laughs> mapping, Jeez. like the, the mapping, the map schema always trails whatever the database schema is. So it has less than or equal to the number of fields, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so like database migrations are kind of 
going to have to be something we think about pretty hard. Um, especially with stuff like the large hadron migrator, um, that caused some weird stuff because it like creates new tables, inserts a bunch of stuff, renames. Uh, so that I had some issues with just developing it. Um, so we'll have to think about that. Um, yeah. yeah. I think so. Well, ben, is, uh, theoretically, is every team supposed to sort of have like independent access to the entire stream? Or are we treating the stream sort of like um, we treat APIs where teams can expose things out of the stream? Because I, I guess I'm just wondering, how is everyone going to stay on the same page about if you're consuming right operations to the database um, and then another team changes the, the structure of the table or something and you're not anticipating it, how are people staying on the same page about that? Yeah, I mean, it, it wouldn't, it potentially wouldn't be any worse than it is now. Because um, <laughs> like anytime we make a change now, we have to check with everyone, make sure that the data team isn't using our scripts or using scripts that run off of other tables. Um, there are like schema management services and stuff like that you can set up. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is sort of like a contract you have to enforce. Yeah, I was going to say like, uh... Like right now, like besides data team, which is more of an offline thing, right? But like, we do have a lot of trouble in terms of like not leaking schema so that it doesn't have like. In this scenario would probably be more likely to happen, but um, what I usually see people doing would be like I'm not familiar with Maxwell specifically, but I was looking at some uh, Elasticsearch stuff, and honestly, a lot of the things that I see is there is some layer or some task that basically is. It's just normalizing the data into yeah. uh, a common like so basically like so at some point we'll be translating the MySQL into JSON documents uh, so that you have like a single place that it's going to change and you don't have to do it. Yeah, yeah. Another thing, uh, Kafka is a uh, right? Which is the um, it's like something that people use <laughs> with Kafka a lot, but you don't have to. But like it's just a Internally, uh, was actually created for Kafka, but, but anyway, it, it, it has a like a schema definition with a version as well. Yeah. So you can version your payload schemas that goes into the topic, and you can basically have workers basically either ignore or log or, or do something with the version. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for that, um, Kafka just transmits like binary byte arrays, um, and on top of that, you can use like uh, Maxwell actually does JSON, but you can do Avro, which has more schema management systems on top. Did you, I don't even know if this is actually an issue, did, did you see anything on like how people handle failed writes? Failed writes? Yeah. Um, no. Um, so it's, not, it's, it's not like a discovered issue? Yeah, it's, it's fairly stable as far as I know. Um, you do often do stuff like batching writes to get performance. <clears throat> so there is always the chance of failure there. Um, it's the same as the writing to MySQL. Oh, yeah. 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 Or, or rescue. So, but, so like, in writing to MySQL or something, it would be, and I don't fully understand the connection here, but it would, it would, that exception would be caught within the application, right? Right. Yeah. Like, this is, this is a. Well, network. maybe. I mean, it depends on, so like there's a trade-off between performance and how much you care that okay. the data actually gets written. Okay. So like, there's a question that I switched me, is like the sense of the wide uh, error. error, error that, uh, okay. Yeah. So, so one thing that uh, the, actually, um, so we talked about how if, you are reading and you've gotten, so like this reader has gotten up to position 11. <laughs> At that point, you know that position 0 through 10 have been processed. Um, so usually what readers will do is they'll checkpoint. So say every five events, they'll send a checkpoint. Um, so say destination system A dies during this processing. Um, it might go back to position 5 and reprocess 5 and 6. Um, so you have to... Um, just be aware of that. 
Right, but does so, the sensor provide visibility? So like the well, so like, guy, yeah, it's, can I see the exception in the batteries? Like, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's logging stuff built into so Yarn. Like I, I write to Copper sensor, does it send a response back? Uh, it does, I believe you, yeah, you can do asynchronously or synchronously, um, and I think you'll you'll get a confirmation. Um, there's also so for the like different partitions, um, so these will be replicated to multiple servers. Um, so you can set it up to either like I don't care if this actually gets in, just like I'm going to send the data out there. Um, you can also say wait till one server has committed it, or you can say wait till, like, say all three have received and committed. I have a question about the library. So, supports <coughs> zero point nine, right? Yeah. So that's the the Ruby libraries. Um, so, or like automatic, um, the automatic balancing of uh, consumers over positions. Yeah. So that was Zendesk's. Uh, Ruby Kafka. Um, so this is a Ruby library for Kafka. Um, I tried doing stream processing with this, but it's kind of like slow and not super. Um, <clears throat> there's like a correctness um, in the SAMSA stuff that is not as present in this. Um, so like handling repartitions, um, handling a failed stream, and things like that. Uh, but it works pretty well just for pushing messages to Kafka. So that would look like this here. You initialize a producer and then produce to a message to a topic called test messages. Okay. Can we look at uh, things like Kinesis compare? Yeah, I have. Um, so Kinesis is the Amazon's implementation. Yeah, so Kinesis is Amazon's implementation. Um, it's kind of like Kafka, but not exactly. Um, it's sort of like how Elasticache is kind of like memcached, like with a protocol, um, but not exactly on the back end. Um, so Kinesis also doesn't have some of the newer features like log compaction, uh, which is actually something you can use to sort of simulate that infinite stream of changes to a table. Um, is it based on Kafka? Or it's just I, I think it's something it started as something else. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's, is it log based or is it just a it is it is the same log based. Um it's also a little bit it's not as focused on latency, so Kafka writes are usually like one to two milliseconds, whereas um, Kinesis can take a little bit longer. Um, there's also like RabbitMQ, which is uh, a messaging system. Um, that's Kafka's kind of the similar idea, but it goes at it in like the log um, log format, um, which can be persisted to disk. Um, so like you can store a week's worth of messages in Kafka, and it's no big deal. Uh, whereas like RabbitMQ is more about like complex um, routing of messages. It's more like write once, read once kind of stuff. Um, so it's not as effective for, um, say, the like uh, writing everything to the log and then multiple people read that data and act on it. That's also quite a bit more performant than uh, Kinesis. I think uh, like I read an article on uh, M4 on uh, AWS and they talk about doing about thirty thousand writes per second, whereas uh, Kinesis sort of like about twenty thousand. Yeah. 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 So if we should kind of wrap up here. Uh, so, in like my very limited exposure to Kafka, you like do crew install a few things, and then you're up and running, um, and then you look at like what it takes to set it up in production. And everyone's like two keepers of hands applied. You have to do all this stuff. Have you like it's more of an ops question, but have you discovered anything around how to avoid that? Or you just kind of your teeth uh, I'm not going to grit my teeth in Barrett. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, I think that's, that's just something we're going to have to figure out.